universities and two colleges from remote parts of Bengal, one from Bakura and the other from the coal belt area of West Bengal, under two different universities have come together today to welcome the the propounder and the sort of the flag bearer of post-colonial theory today. It is a great day for us. Uh, this uh, theory, uh, this uh, webinar series of post-colonial theory and practice will open many foggy windows in our minds and the variedness of the titles of the three days that will proceed will give us a better idea and who ca can open this better than our keynote speaker today, Professor Bill Ashcroft. Sir, you have really, you know, distended our hearts with pride by being here today. Uh, it is a great honor and a great privilege for us. Uh, we will now start our inaugural program. I invite our respected principal, of Triveni Devi Bhalotia College, Dr. Ashish Kumar De, to deliver his welcome address on this August occasion. Principal, sir. Uh, very good morning to one and all. Thank you, At sir. The very outside, I welcome all of you. Actually, I feel honored that Triveni Devi Bhalotia College English Department, in collaboration of Onda College, Onda Mohabit Jala, English Department, has organized international web lecture series on contemporary trends in post-colonialism theory and practice. The topic has taken a significant turn towards the universal, towards the human. So far my knowledge or so far my information is concerned, I know that this web lecture will be delivered by some of the best thinkers and theorists from all over the world. At this moment, I have a great proud privilege to welcome Professor B. Lapscott, Professor of Emeritus School of English, Media and Performing Art, New South Wales University, Australia, and founding exponent of post-colonial theory. Actually, it doesn't for I am very much glad and proud for his presence and for giving his consent as a, not only as a research person, but actually he will deliver his lecture on post-colonial theory today. It's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Fayala Maki, Professor of Post-Colonial Literature, University of Lili, France for spending her valuable time at this web series. Professor Fayana Martin will share us her article on reading Amitabha Ghosh on a tour of Canada's petroscopes. In the next two days, we have also Dr. Claire Omhover, professor of English and post-colonial literature, University of Paul Valery, and and Professor Vivas Choudhury, Professor of English, Govati University, Assam. I a warm welcome both of you for the touring presence of this web series. We have also, actually the day after tomorrow, we have also Professor Thomas J. Lin, Associate Professor of English, Penn State, Bak USA, and Dr. Kunal Basu, Professor of Said Business School, Oxford University, the UK, who are the notable author. I will I take the opportunity to welcome both of you, sir. I am pleased to welcome Dr. Vijay Kumar Dubey, Principal on the Thana Mohabit Alloy, and all participants like teachers, scholars, students, and other respected dignitaries those who have in online Google Meet or YouTube or any other Facebook or any other platform. I also mention here and I also welcome Dr. Sarvani Banerjee, mentor of this program and other joint organizing secretaries of both the colleges, coordinators of IPC of both the colleges, the organizing members and committees 
of this web series. Actually, we live in a world of expanding new deep and in an age where there is no certainty of certainty of categorization. Post-colonialism addresses the issue of the historical, political, cultural, and textual ramification of the colonial encounter between the imperial West and the colonized East, dating back from the 16th century to the present time. It is a critical theoretical approach in literary, in literary and cultural studies which address issues with how the East and West, how the East and West encounter set all those who are a party to it. It generally represents an ideological response to colonial thought, so rather than simply describing a system that comes after colonialism. It establishes intellectual sets for sub altered people to speak for themselves in their own voices and thus produce their own individual and cultural identity, thereby provisionalizing the West. But in the recent time, there has been a radical change in the field of contemporary post-colonial studies within and with this split, I hope this three days web lecture series will help all the attendees by enlightening them with the contemporary themes of the post-colonial studies. I think that the lecture delivered by the renowned stalwart of these post-colonial studies will, uh, will, will illuminate them and will have a broad pool of knowledge a stick away from this venture. I end here by hoping that this web series will end up as a grand factor. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Unmute. Unmute. Unmute, ma'am. Unmute yourself. Sorry. Thank you so much, Principal Sir, for your inspiring words. I will now request. Uh, Dr. Shourab Kumar Nag from Odathana Mahabidyalaya to speak for himself as well as for his principal who was unable to join. Shourab, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Shourabhanadi. A very good morning to everyone present here. Uh, I regret to announce that our principal, sir, is uh, actually preoccupied with some uh, official assignment and that's why he couldn't make it. So, uh, But he has promised to, to be there. Uh, from tomorrow and if possible uh, from the second session today. Uh, on behalf of uh, the principal, sir, uh, Dr. Vijay Kandhube, Kondadana Mahabhidala, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all the participants. Uh, but before everything, uh, and above everything, I must thank Professor B. Lesko for making journey. I was in Bremen. I hope, sir, uh, remember uh, in the last year, sir uh, had uh, delivered a lecture at the University of Bremen. It was uh, a webinar, uh, sorry, it was a seminar on post-colonial oceans, and there we met. Uh, I, uh, today, it is, I, I'm so thrilled. It is like a dream come true that uh, the book that the books that we have grown up reading on post-colonial theory, the very man is uh, sitting in front of me, and he will be delivering lecture. For, the, for two colleges and for uh, hundreds of participants, thousands of uh, audiences, because we are going to stream uh, the web lectures piece every day from 7 p.m. onwards. Uh, I, I, I am simply awestruck to have been a spot among us. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, all the theoretical doctrines, uh, actually, post colonialism, uh, according to me, is perhaps the most human because. Uh, Post-colonialism always uh, speaks of, always claims for the equal right of all the human beings, irrespective of their territorial and geographical location, cultural nuances. So it is perhaps the most human of all the theoretical aspects. Uh, I can quote Robert Young, who says that uh, post-colonialism claims the right of all people on this earth to the same material and cultural well-being. 
what can be better than that kind of an attitude? And uh, very recently, there are certain uh, uh, new new emergences or tendencies. New tendencies are getting emerging uh, nowadays, uh, and that are offering us a kind of universal outlook. Be it uh, uh, the best of poverty in provincializing Europe or in uh, global in global ethics. The contemporary critics are uh, trying to uh, offer us a kind of uh, universal outlook, universal culture, universal world where any point on earth, any point on earth can be the center. Or in, in another word, that we can obliterate the center. So, uh, and and uh, at the very end, I would like to thank all the faculty members of the English department of Ulapana Mahavidyala as well as of TTB College. And uh, a special thank to Sharvani. Uh, she has helped me immensely, and we collaborated together. Uh, uh, we have uh, called each other ten times, fifteen times every day uh, to make it happen. I also uh, extend my special thanks to the principal sir of TTB College and Sujit, my uh, brother. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, the audience. Uh, thank you. I would like to. Uh, I would like to request. Uh, Dr. Shorbani Banerjee to introduce Professor Bill Ascroft to the audience. No, uh, sorry, Shora. Uh, we yeah. still have the uh, convener's oh, address I, by. I forgot. I forgot to Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I will. This is. Uh, thank you, Shora, for your wonderful yeah. words, and especially that mention about me. Yes, we have been having nerve wracking meetings every day. And I also include my department. We have been meeting almost every two, three days and finalizing this program. It is now my great uh, pleasure uh, to request uh, Shujit Malik, Associate Professor of my college and my colleague. He is the head of the Department of Undergraduate Studies of our college and is the co-convener uh, of this uh, webinar series. I request him to share a few words. Should you uh, please? Uh, good morning to all, uh, to all participants and Professor Bill at top. Uh, and with now, you know, uh, I am sitting, uh, doing virtually, but I am sitting in front of Bill at top. That's a mad rough, I mean, a big bit novel. So, uh, pandemic situation that we have been facing uh, since last of March, has restricted uh, uh, many activities in various things. But we can't, we can't stop our academic pursuit, we can't stop our intellectual practices. And that outside, Department of Literature in English, GDB College, uh, jointly with Ondakana Mahavidala, has organized an international web lecture series for three days, uh, beginning from today. Noted theorist, scholar, across the world will be signing as a star of this event. But I'm not going to discuss on that issue because uh, the, the scholars are there. But I have just, I just want to mention one incident. That, that incident, I mean, uh, Sassi Theru, we, all, we are all familiar with Sassi Theru, Sassi Theru uh, writer, administrator, and one of the finest orators of our time. He uh, uh, delivered a lecture or uh, participated in a debate convened by Oxford University Union. And there he, uh, uh, there he launched a scathing attack on, on, on colonial practice. Actually, that the topic of the debate was uh, British Raj, uh, reparation and reclaim. That was the topic. There, Mr. Thoreau launched a um, scathing attack on, on, on the colonial practices. And he received, uh, he received Use applause from all quarters because he has done the daunting task of exposing the blackest facet of, of, of exploitation actually exacted by a colonial ruler. It, it, it was quite soothing to hear him uh, that, 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 that a colonized man, I mean, colonized, criticized colonizers directly. But it is quite, I mean, difficult for us. We will not be able to. We will to face off a colonized colonizer uh, directly. So post-colonial studies that uh, it has given an ample opportunity for people like us to question the right, the question the the, the, the cultural hegemony practiced by uh, the colonial ruler. And uh, it has I mean 
for me a colonial i mean post colonial studies is just like a multi purpose instrument uh, uh, it it explores the violence which established itself as an independent discipline and thirdly which is important right now that is uh, uh, it, it 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 also it also locate the point of neo colonial forces that has been surfaced in contemporary times that was a, i mean uh, so the, it is just a, it's just it's a, a big a very sketchy outline sketchy outline of this i always prefer one term of this event of this of this topic that is register we the wretched of the art post colonialism or post colonial studies serve as an resist, I mean, instrument of resistance for us that is all about i, I just want to, I, i always inspire my student or ask my student always try to add at that point of resistance very important and uh, last but not least i take the metaphor from the cricket i must say the opening of the game of cricket is very important very crucial and the opener he always plays a pivotal role in the game of cricket and we have a robust opener of this event and welcome professor pillar stop along with us thank you very much and uh, now i would i would request uh, dr swarbani banerjee to introduce professor bill ascroft to the audience thank you so much shoura i am sure this is just a very mere formality because uh, professor bill ascroft needs no introduction uh, his phenomenal books his articles his theories uh, have always inspired us has regenerated us to think anew Uh, nevertheless for the young students who are here i can see many students here let me uh, uh, you know enjoy this moment of pride and privilege to introduce him to you all he is presently emeritus professor in the school of english media and performing arts in the university of new south wales australia he is a founding exponent of post colonial theory no who is there who has not heard of his empirical book the empire rights act it has until then even presently he is expressing new theories i had the privilege of listening to him a month ago and he is now presently uh, you know deliberating on a new aspect of nationalism that he likes to call transnationalism uh hope that we can hear a few words on that too sir he has uh, co-authored more than 20 to 25 books more than uh, hundreds of articles his most famous books after the empire rights back are post colonial transformation in 2001 post colonial futures 2001 intimate horizons 2009 utopianism in post colonial literature i can go on for 2 hours if i have to read out all that he has written and spoken and thought about but it is a day when we are very very happy to have him here and i would like just like to share uh, with the audience my correspondence with him some two weeks ago as you all know he is a very busy person very academically active and when i requested him from a small college in one corner of india he said charpani i'm very busy i'm overburdened and flooded with invitations but i will do it for you if you can promise that it will complete in one hour and if the questions are less compared to the usual because so we are very thankful professor ashcroft sir for finding time for us i know you are very busy and very you know overexposed as of now you are giving so many lectures for all of us but let it be said that each lecture that you give is a new opening and a new direction for old academics like me and for new academics like those who are present here thank you so much sir i request you to now deliver your keynote address thank you um thank you very much um professor energy um it's a, a very great delight to me to be here to speak to uh uh people in indian academy because india has such a formative and powerful uh, role in the development of uh, post colonial studies and uh, so i never tire of um, bringing that to the fore 
Today, uh, I'm going to talk about <clears throat> post-colonialism today, and I'll just bring up the, um, try to, uh, okay. Just bring up a window to share, and um, let's see, let's see how we go. Yes, sir, we can see it. Okay. Yes, we can see it. All right. Yes, Good. sir. Uh, so, post-colonialism today is, uh, is the topic of my talk. And I, uh, I use that, uh, that title because post-colonialism is an incredibly vibrant and changing uh, field. Um, and it's a field that embraces all kinds of approaches and it, it uh, uh, embraces all kinds of, uh, of theorists. You know, even people who start off uh, critiquing the, the idea of the post-colonial end up being part of the post-colonial uh, stable, if you like. So I want to uh, think about the... Um, in a post-colonialism today, but first, as I often do, I want to go to the basics and say, well, what is post-colonial theory? Because there are so many misconceptions about uh, particularly the term post-colonial. Well, it's that branch of contemporary theory that investigates and develops propositions about the cultural and political impact of European conquest upon colonised societies and the nature of those societies' responses. So there's two aspects to it. There's the impact of European conquest, and that's where Edward Said's Orientalism comes in, the nature of those societies' responses, their capacity to transform the dominant discourses uh, that have colonised them, that is where the Empire Rights Pact comes in. Now, the, uh, the term, the, the idea of the post has been confusing people for decades, but uh, the term refers to post-invasion, if anything, and not post-independence. It identifies neither a chronology nor a specific ontology. There's no one way of being post-colonial. It's not after colonialism, nor is it a way of being. And I want to emphasise this. Post-colonial is a way of reading. Now it's a reading practice that draws attention to the profound and continuing effects of colonization upon literary production, upon anthropological accounts, historical records, and scientific and administrative writing. And above all, of course, it is a reading of post-colonial literatures because it's the transformation of English in the uh, literatures written by the colonised and formerly colonised that has transformed the field, that has in fact developed the field. And so uh, it's important to uh, emphasise the centrality of literature and literary study. Now, post-colonial, uh, post-colonialism today is like a, a convivial critical democracy. Now, convivial from uh, convivere, meaning live together. A lot of different uh, theories and theorists and approaches uh, and attitudes live together in this uh, critical democracy that's called uh, post-colonial theory. And the interesting thing about it is that, of course, it uh, rejects um, it, it rejects normative. Uh, controlling ideas about what the uh, what the field is and it welcomes all kinds of new approaches and new branches now um, an interesting thing when we're thinking about uh, what is post-colonialism today an interesting thing happened in the 1990s globalization studies were uh, proceeding apace and they're mostly driven by 
economics and politics and the idea of development the development theories um, that uh, many people describe the European uh, the Western impact on, on the world um, but the the language of literature developed a cultural turn in globalization studies and Simon so Gandhi um, puts it this way they post-colonialism globalization studies have at least two important things in common firstly they're concerned with explaining forms of social and cultural organization whose ambition is to transcend the boundaries of the nation state and I'll say a little bit more about that later Secondly, they seek to provide new ways to understand cultural flows that can no longer be explained by a homogeneous Eurocentric narrative of development and social change. And those are two global and significant approaches, uh, the things that bring uh, post-colonialism and globalization together. But the important thing is the cultural turn in globalization studies have driven by the language of post-colonialism. And that language demonstrates that the strategies developed in post-colonial theory are appropriate to uh, read the modern world. Now, <clears throat> around the turn of the century, there were uh, a lot of talk, books, about the future of post-colonial studies. Some people said, is the post-colonial over? Uh, what was post-colonialism and uh, the uh, a plethora of ideas about the future of post-colonial studies arose at the beginning of the century. Now, post-colonial studies today involves a very wide variety of, of studies. There's uh, the well-known field of transnational literatures, transculturalism, multiple modernities, world literature, cosmopolitanism, post-colonial sacred and post-colonial eco-criticism. And of course we could add to that the uh, emerging field of decolonial studies but uh, um, I haven't put that in because decolonialism has got nothing that post-colonial study doesn't have. So Every one of these topics I could uh, discourse for some time, but I just want to uh, um, mention they, they, they're all themes that you would recognise, they're all themes that you'd be well aware of. Um, but I am interested in the continuing relevance of post-colonial analysis. You know, a lot of people want to consign it to the 19th century of British imperialism. But what we find is that uh, the activity of writers and uh, colonised intellectuals has demonstrated the emergence of strategies that are important in uh, dealing with the world today. The uh, empires of cultural, technological and economic power and their colonising effects. As was mentioned earlier, neo-colonialism is alive and well. But the, uh, the, the thing I want to point out is that post-colonial theory is not a grand theory of everything, but it does have strategies that are appropriate and useful for addressing the operation of power, social, cultural and economic power in the world today. And when I talk about post-colonialism now, I want to mention how I am developing post-colonial studies. Three, uh, three aspects to this. Post-colonial utopianism, borders and bordering, and the concept of transnation. Now, utopianism in post-colonial literatures is an interesting um, topic to be talking about. Most people think of utopia as just pie in the sky, wishful thinking, um, a fantasy. But there's a very big difference uh, between 
Thomas More's Utopia and the spirit of hope that drives people to imagine a different world. It's interesting that the Utopian Study Society was formed in 1988 and Empire Rides Back was written, published actually in 1989. So they have a kind of coeval emergence. And yet, interestingly, uh, Utopian studies have been entirely absent from post-colonial studies uh, for three decades. Um, now, the min magisterial uh, book by Ernst Bloch, Principle of Hope, well, actually, it's uh, a, a series of three books, um, was, was written during the Second World War and really became, after its translation into English in 1986, it became a foundational text in uh, utopian studies. And that has led to Frederick Jameson's Archaeologies of the Future. Both of these people are Marxists. And the interesting thing about uh, utopian studies is it's been driven by a combination of Marxism and science fiction throughout the, uh, the 20th century. But the reason I am interested in post-colonial utopianism is because the writing of post-colonial writers is always enthused, motivated. It has the dynamic of a vision of the future. Now, there's a difference between utopia and utopianism. Um, utopia is that placeless place. Utopianism is the spirit of hope. A difference between the representation of utopia and the anticipatory function of utopianism. Uh, Lyman Tower Sargent calls utopianism social dreaming. And uh, Ruth Levitas says, it's the desire for a better way of living expressed in the description of a different kind of society that makes possible that alternative way of life. Now, post-colonial writing might not necessarily uh, represent a different uh, future, but all writing has the capacity to represent something that's driven by the imagination. And this is where um, the uh, importance of uh, utopianism to post-colonial studies emerges. Now, there's an interesting irony in Thomas More's post-utopia. The, there's an irony in the idea of post-colonial utopia for the simple reason that More's utopia was a classic uh, colonising process. King Utopus invades the land, he changes its name, civilises the indigenous inhabitants and cultivates the natural wasteland. And there you have a succinct model of imperial invasion and colonization. And yet that, uh, that representation of the placeless place has uh, inspired people's imaginations ever since. Now, the importance of art and literature in this is absolutely crucial. Um, Ernst Bloch was adamant and wrote a, a book about the uh, function of art and literature in uh, imaging a different world. And interestingly, Ben Okri says, writers are the dream mechanism of the human race. Writers are the dream mechanism of the human race. That is, writers, because they operate from the imagination, have the capacity to visualise a different world. Um, and as I said before, that world might not always be optimistic. It might not always be utopian. But the very fact that writers can dream of a different world demonstrates their a dream function in human society. Now, Bloch's term for this in literature is Vorschein, foreseeing, or anticipatory illumination, the revelation of the possibilities for rearranging social and political relations to produce HIMAP. Now, 
Heimat, of course, is a German word for home. And uh, it was very interesting because the Nazis uh, made a lot of use of Heimat as, as the, uh, the racial home. And what uh, Ernst Bloch does is turn this on its head. He says, Heimat is the home we've all sensed, but never experienced or known. It is Heimat as utopia that determines the truth content of a work of art. So this is what's driving the utopianism of literature and particularly the utopianism of post-colonial writing. The idea of Heimat, of a home that we've sensed, of a possible world, a possible society that we sense is possible but we haven't yet experienced. And this possibility uh, demonstrates the truth content of a work of art. Now, a, um, <clears throat> a critic has recently said, that, you know, the most practical thing that a, uh, a writer or intellectual can do is imagine utopia because this is the thing that drives uh, the human uh, spirit, the idea that things can be possible, that things can change. And so Heimat becomes deeply important in uh, Bloch's philosophy, but also deeply important in post-colonial writing. Now, very often that uh, Heimat, that home in the future, is driven by memory, <clears throat> and memory not as nostalgia, but a memory of what things can be beyond the uh, strictures of colonial and imperial control. And I want to suggest that uh, that capacity to see beyond is what gives uh, post-colonial theory such a purchase in addressing the contemporary world uh, with its neo-colonial operations. Now, for Bloch, Heimat always lies beyond the border. And that introduces the idea of borders, which is another, uh, I suppose, direction that I see post-colonial uh, theory going in. Borders and bordering. <clears throat> now, borders uh, are something we can't imagine the world being without. But I want us to just ponder this. What would the world look like without borders? How would we live? Could we live? Are humans so ingrained in the idea of self and other, so ingrained in, in the idea of demonising the other, that <clears throat> life would be impossible without borders? Well, the um, borders have grown pretty well exponentially. At the end of World War II, there were seven border walls. And when the Berlin Wall fell, there were 15 border walls. And today, there are 77 border walls or fences. And of course, the most notorious of these is the unfinished border wall between the US and Mexico. And a lot of, uh, a lot of politicians are so committed to borders because as Donald Trump has said, without borders, you don't have a nation. That's an interesting thought. It's probably quite untrue, but it is interesting that uh, the way in which we conceive the nation is through borders and bordering. So what is a border? Well, naturally, we think of borders as walls, as perimeters, as things constructed to keep the outsiders out or the insiders in. But I want to suggest that a border is not a thing, but a practice. It's a practice that operates both beyond and within the physical borders of the nation state. And when we think of border uh, and borders as bordering, as practices, it really changes the way we understand 
the process of bordering. It changes the way we understand the operation of colonial power, the operation of power itself. And it helps us um, understand the operation of that phenomenon that doesn't seem to have any borders, global capitalism. So a border is not a thing, and it's a practice moving beyond and within the physical borders of the state. So a border is both a consequence and a production of power relationships. Okay, the, uh, the person who sets up the border or the, the country or the group are the people with power. But uh, the very establishment of the border uh, produces those uh, and uh, increases and exacerbates that power relationship. And this is true of the bordering practices of, uh, of, of contemporary nation states. So when we uh, think about borders, we think about how human society clings to them. Um, and yet we can see beyond them. This is, a, uh, this is the wall built in the West Bank to uh, enclose Palestine from Israel. It's uh, where Israel has colonized part of the West Bank and set up a, uh, a wall to keep Palestinians out. And yet what we see here is a combination of the refusal of borders and the, uh, the utopian vision of possibility. This little uh, painting on the wall is a, a model for the way in which art and literature can look beyond the borders and bordering practices of the state to a different kind of world, a different kind of future. It's uh, uh, remarkably symbolic of that. Even though it seems to be uh, achieving little, it achieves a lot through the power of the imagination. And that's why art and literature are so important. Now, when we think of borders, uh, I'm drawn to a poem by Kavafi, uh, Waiting for the Barbarians, which is, of course, as you know, uh, was the, um, the, the, the poem that stimulated uh, Jan Kurtzi's Waiting for the Barbarians. And it goes like this. Why this sudden restlessness and confusion? How serious people's faces have become. Why are the streets and squares emptying so rapidly? Everyone going home so lost in thought. Because night has fallen and the barbarians have not come. And some who have just returned from the border say, there are no barbarians any longer. Now what will become of us without barbarians? They were those people a kind of solution. Now, everybody listening to this today can focus on their own uh, bordered state and see that barbarians are important. If barbarians don't exist, who are we? And if uh, the barbarians can't be um, seen to be the other, who are we? What is our self? So fascinating. Without barbarians, what will become of us? In other, in other words, borders are necessary for us to get the impression of identity. Now, identity is a fiction and perhaps the great fiction, national identity being the great fiction of our time. But it is generated and kept in place by the bordering practices of the state. And in this case, the idea of the barbarians is a very important idea for helping us understand who we are. So the borders extend within. We often think, well, we we're bound to think of a border as a perimeter, as something that's around, built around something built around a space, but the borders operate within. 
And Mitchell says the boundary of the state never marks a real exterior. It is a line drawn internally within the network of institutional mechanisms through which a certain social and political order is maintained. That is the bordering, the bordering practices of the state operating within the network of institutional mechanisms. And that bordering practices, those bordering practices are the things that uh, maintain order, maintain control, maintain power uh, within the state. Now, Simonson says there are eight borders or boundary markers as criteria for national membership. National ancestry, being of the national religion, birth on the country's soil, having lived in the country for most of one's life, language skills, respect for the country's laws and institutions, having host national citizenship and feeling as part of the nation. Now, you see the way those bordering practices are operating. There may be people who are not part of the national religion. There may be people who are not born on the country's soil, who haven't lived in uh, the country for most of their life. But they're, country, they're, they're, they're people who want to obtain citizenship. But you see the way, the subtle way, bordering practices, boundary markers work as criteria. Whatever um, that refugee or that asylum seeker hopes to gain, the bordering practices, the subtle bordering practices of the state are still uh, exclude them. And so that's a, uh, that's, that's a very distinct way in which um, the bordering practices of the state work, the borders within. Now, Salman Rushdie and step across his line says, good writing assumes a frontierless nation. Writers who serve frontiers have become border guards. In our deepest natures, we are frontier crossing beings. We know this for the stories we tell ourselves, for we are storytelling animals too. Now, <clears throat> I want to suggest that the memory of the nation state is history, national history. But the memory of the nation, those people, hello, those people who operate uh, between and within the borders of the state, um, they are the people who demonstrate the potential and the possibility uh, of the of the nation. So the creative spirit for which literature is a powerful metonym, is the ultimate border crosser. You said before, I said before that uh, Ernst Bloch really focused on art and literature as a, that which has the anticipatory illumination. And also, literature is the ultimate border crosser. It is inherently post-national because its tendency is not to belong. The nationality of literatures is a function of reading rather than writing. High map is not the nation, but the horizon of possibility. Now, when I say nation, national identity is a function of reading, what I mean is that a writer doesn't pick up a pen and say, I'm going to uh, write about the nation. I'm going to demonstrate uh, national identity here. It's, uh, this is a function of the institutions of reading, the um, criticism, um, publishing, uh, the universities, teaching, all these things. Uh, and, and this is true particularly in Australia because it's a, a young country has a great uh, obsession with identity. The literature is held by the institutions of reading to be signs of national identity. So this leads us, when we think about 
the people circulating around the bordering practices of the state. This leads us to the concept of the transnation. Now, the transnation is different from the transnational. The transnational is that uh, operation of crossing borders of interaction between states, between nations. The transnation is something that can cross borders, but more often operates within the physical borders of the state. And the transnation is that uh, congregation of subjects who circulate around the bordering practices of the state. Now, this, uh, this picture here demonstrates how the individual subjectivities can be woven into something that looks like uh, a nation, a national identity even, but individual, individually these strands are all very different. So <clears throat> the transnation really celebrates this, uh, this idea of the uh, circulation around the bordering practices of the state. Now the transnation develops from the uh, very great uh, um, sort of um, dubiousness. Uh, uh, sir, uh, Professor Ashcroft, sir, yes. there yes. are other slides are not visible. Oh, no. Yes, it's stuck to the first slide, sir. Oh, not again. <laughs> it happened another time as well, yes. <laughs> oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, it is we can, uh, it is there in your si in your uh, side uh, the slide list but yeah. uh, it uh, the focusing on the first slide only all right this uh, okay uh, you can take a few minutes to uh, undo it right. so it's no problem we have a lot of time you see a change is it changing now no now the presentation has gone off you have to start presentation again Right. Okay. Right. Yes. This is a incredibly anticlimactic, isn't it? <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I don't know how to. There stop. are some ac academics who are commenting that your lecture is mesmerizing, even without the slides. <laughs> uh, okay. Now. Oh goodness! I nearly, <laughs> I nearly finished. I wish you'd have uh, told me earlier, but I okay, don't know sir. why. I don't know why this happens. But um, mm -hmm. uh, shall I quickly run through the slides again? Um, <clears throat> yes, we have. We have a lot of time. All right, we're looking at a window. Uh, the present, uh, you have to start the presentation again. This, you have to click on the start. Yes, yes. Can now this is, yes, you can see the first I, slide. If I do that, mm -hmm. does it, can you see it animated? Uh, yes, we can, we have gone back to the previous, the first slide only. Oh, really? Yes. So, what is colonial theory? You can't see that. Yes. So Nilanjana has come up to help. Nilanjana, you have any help? Professor, professor good morning, Professor. Uh, actually, I was thinking if you could, you know, instead of starting the presentation, if you could just manually go through the slides because yes. last time it worked. Okay. All right. Um, I mean, number one, uh, first, uh, if you could share the screen, All then right. number two, number two, okay. without starting, you know, without starting the PPT, if you could manually take us to your slides, manually. I mean, just highlighting. Well, manually. Yeah, yeah, manually. Okay. Uh, yes, well, yes, that would be a good idea. Yes. And I think you you are on your slide number forty. Forty. Right. Uh, okay. Um, oh dear. Ah. Screen share first. Screen All share. Right. Okay, now 
if I share this as is, um, can you see that? Not yet, sir. Not yet, sir. Okay. I'll share it without... Without starting the PPT. Yes, yeah. now you have shared the screen. Now, if you could just manually... Ma yes, man yes, now we have come to the slide. What yeah. is post-colonial theory? Right, yeah. okay. Yes. Uh, and then we went through looking yes. at... Uh, yes, this was, this was the first, yes. Yes. There's something about this platform, Ta. But, um, <clears throat> okay. So I talked about the growing themes, transnational literatures, transculturalism, and all those things that are becoming a part of uh, uh, post-colonial theory today. And I'm interested in the continuing relevance of post-colonial analysis, and uh, what I want to talk about today are how I'm developing post-colonial studies, and that's when I uh, started talking about post-colonial utopianism. And the... Um, the Utopian Studies Society uh, was formed in 1988 when uh, the Empire Rights Pact was written in 89. And so they have a kind of coeval um, relationship. Now, can you still see the, uh, the PowerPoint? We can see it. We can see it, sir. Okay. We, we can see post-colonial utopianism, yes. Okay. Good. Well, that, uh, that's where I talked about what the magisterial the principle of hope and uh, the uh, contemporary theorist, Frederick Jameson. As I said before, these, these are Marxist utopians and utopianism has been driven by a combination of Marxism and uh, science fiction. And there's a difference between utopia and utopianism. Utopianism is the spirit of hope. And that is why it's so important in post-colonial writing. The spirit of hope is the spirit that imagines a different kind of future. Uh, it's for, for Sargent, it's social dreaming, for Levitas, the desire of a better way of living expressed in the description of a different kind of society that makes possible a different way of life. So, um, and again, let me repeat that uh, the anticipatory function of literature is, is incredibly important to Ernst Bloch. And perhaps this makes literature so central to uh, the utopian uh, movement. And it's because it has what he calls Vorschein, foreseeing, or anticipatory illumination, the revelation for our. Uh, of possibilities for rearranging social and political relations to produce Heimat. And Heimat, uh, that home that we have sensed but never experienced or known, that Heimat, that home, it both determines the truth content of a work of art, but most importantly, the block Heimat always lies beyond the border. And that's where I brought in the, uh, the next uh, theme, borders and bordering. Um, and borders are uh, incredibly important in organising the world. What would the world look like without borders, as I said? Uh, the borders have grown since the end of World War II. There were seven border walls then. When Berlin Wall fell, there were 15 border walls, and today... There are 77. And as, as I said before, the most notorious of these is the border wall between the United States and Mexico. And then, but I wanted to delve deeper into this. What is a border? What is a border? And we think of borders as perimeters, as things built around the edge. But in fact, a border is not a thing but a practice. And bordering practices are... Um, both a consequence and a production of power relationships. It's power relationships that establish borders and it's borders that maintain those power relationships. So borders are extremely important 
uh, for post-colonial studies, which is from its inception been interested in power relationships, a particular form of power relationship. Now, you wouldn't have seen this, I, I talked about it, but this is the, the wall between um, Israel and Palestine in the West Bank. It was set up by the Israeli government. And the interesting thing about this is the, the vision of a different kind of world is a, uh, a refusal of the border a refusal of the border that's based on a utopian vision of a different kind of world. And I think this is symbolic, this, uh, this picture here of a different kind of world is symbolic of the potential for imagining high map in, um, in, in post-colonial literatures. The, the home we've sensed, but yet not yet experienced. High, high map is incredibly important. Um, and uh, I went through uh, reciting Gaddafi's Waiting for the Barbarians. And I, the point I made about that is that when they found that there were no barbarians, suddenly they panicked. What will become of us without barbarians? So barbarians, those people beyond the water, are necessary because they give us an excuse for the border and the border tells us who we are. So borders are not just uh, a function of power, but borders are a way in which power maintains its power and maintains its power over identity, particularly national identity, but not only that. So, so the borders of go within, the borders operate within and the boundary of the state never marks a real exterior. It's a line drawn internally, or lines are drawn internally, with a network of institutional mechanisms through which a certain kind of social and political order is maintained. And there are many ways in which, uh, in which these bordering practices operate, um, you know, through, uh, through laws, through expectations, and through uh, a sense of what, what Gramsci calls hegemony, that is, dominance by consent. States rely on their subjects consenting to dominance and uh, maintaining it and uh, reproducing it. So there are eight borders or boundary markers as criteria for national membership, and I talked about these, national ancestry, national religion, birth on the soil, and, of course, all of these uh, represent some sort of ideal national subject. But those people uh, seeking shelter, seeking refuge, people seeking uh, some form of home in the nation state are not considered, according to these borders, not considered to be uh, worth national membership. And so the, the idea of Ordering practices is incredibly important in establishing national identity and, um, and, and the idea of identity itself. And I, uh, I will re-recite re, re, uh, this. Salman Rushdie, in Step Across This Line, says, good writing assumes a frontierless nation. Writers who serve frontiers have become border guards. In our deepest natures, we are frontier-crossing beings. We know this by the stories we tell ourselves, for we are storytelling animals too. And I, I mentioned that national memory is grounded in history, but the memory of the society, of the culture, is grounded in stories, the stories people tell themselves. And so, that, uh, that idea of the high map as not being the nation but the horizon of possibility introduces me to the, um, the next um, concept, the next direction I want to see post-colonial studies moving, and that is the idea of the transnation. Transnation is not uh, the transnational 
because it can operate within the state as well as beyond it. But the transnation comes about because of uh, the deep post-colonial suspicion of the nation. Um, Wally Soyenka said, talked about Africa being carved up like some demented tailor who paid no attention to the fabric colour pattern of the quilt he was patching together. Now, interestingly enough, the contemporary African states are colonial states. They are uh, occupy the colonial borders. But it, it's interesting that um, the post-independence politicians, nobody has tried to re uh, to re-weave um, that quilt by changing the borders. So in a sense, uh, the contemporary post-independence nation is stuck in the boundaries, the borders established by colonialism. Now, the uh, Hobson in his um, book, Imperialism, suggested that empire-bred nationalism undermines the chance of a true internationalism. And for him, that, uh, that, that occurred in two ways. Either, you know, the, um, what he would call good colonies, that is the settler colonies, developed a kind of national feeling. But on the other hand, uh, people whose nationalism developed as uh, an act of resistance um, also undermined the chance of true internationalism. And Partha Chatterjee has an interesting uh, perspective on this, and he says that nationalism undermines the progress of decolonization because the national form is hostile to their own cultures. In other words, the, the national form is not something uh, in nature, you know, it's not something inherent to any society, it's something that developed from the uh, Treaty of Westphalia uh, in, in Europe. And it has come to define the ways in which uh, the bordering practices of societies are generated. So India is particularly interesting in this because those two great thinkers, Tagore and Gandhi, were uh, adamant in their opposition to nationalism and the critique of the nation state. And in some respects, Gandhi was one of the greatest uh, pure anarchists of, of our time. But um, the transnation then, that, that's the critique of the nations, nation state in particular. The transnation is that fluid migrating outside of the state that begins within the nation. It's a way of talking about subjects who circulate around the bordering practices of the state. So this is bringing together those themes that uh, have been emerging of subjects who circulate around the, the, the power, the structures, the bordering practices of the state. Now, there are many ways in which uh, I have theorised this, but I'll just uh, pick one, perhaps the most significant and uh, useful is Deleuze and Guattari's distinction between smooth and striated space. Striated space is simply the warp and woof, the, uh, the idea of a texture, um, and it's the way in which uh, governments are organised. Smooth space is like a felt, it's rolled, it doesn't really have any, any striations, any structures. And the point is that the transmission is the smooth space that circulates around the striated space of, of the nation. Now, Scott uh, aligns this to something he calls infrapolitics, the undramatic, everyday, a mundane acts of quiet evasion, slowdowns, false compliance, feigned ignorance and sabotage carried out by factory workers, that when performed by many, change or alter a landscape of power. Now, you know, a transnation is not necessarily insurgent or rebellious, but because it has the potential to circulate around the bordering practices of the state, 
of circumventing those sporting practices, it is itself a, a threat to the power of the state. And so uh, it's, it's interesting to see the ways in which um, the, uh, the transnation, which can be composed of people who are entirely law-abiding and, and uh, committed to the nation itself, by their very existence, they uh, operate as a threat to the bordering practices of the state. And to bring these things together, I want to suggest that the creative spirit is the ultimate border crosser. As, uh, as uh, Rushdie has suggested, writers are not border guards. Writers are those who continually, because of the power of the imagination, push beyond the borders that are established. They might be conceptual borders, they might be cultural borders, they might be political borders, but the beauty and the power of the creative spirit is that they imagine a world beyond those borders. So utopianism borders transnation. The intersection of these concepts is where I want to see or where I'm taking post-colonial studies today. Thank you. Uh, as I uh, informed earlier, we'll be uh, picking up a few questions for Professor Bela Uh We have a few more questions here. First, I would like to uh, uh, request Professor Jyoti Shankar Mandal, uh, Associate Professor of Delta Educational University, uh, Puglia, ask your question directly to Professor Bela Stroff. Jyotida, are you here? Uh, maybe I yes. can ask my question. Okay, I have a question. Uh, Professor, uh, I have a question. Before that, I just want to say uh, uh, hi to Fiona. It's good to see you. Uh, uh, Professor Ashcroft, you were talking about borders, and I found that very, very interesting because. Uh, in India, we have been till today uh, facing the aftermath of a severe and possibly the most neurotic uh, partition ever. Uh, now, our partitions have been marked by barbed wires. Yet when I have visited them quite a few times, I have found that there are little boys from Bangladesh or Pakistan who come into uh, the Indian borders with packs full of uh, apples and uh, sugar and they go back. So the border is pretty porous. Some people come to work by day and return by night. So that is the kind of a physical demarcation of the barbed wire. But mm -hmm. what about the psychological demarcation? Because in Punjab and in West Bengal, the your the the topos of east bengal and west bengal is still marked on the psyche even today some marriages do not take place if you belong to east or west bengal um, what would you say to this physical and psychological bordering well that's a very uh, a, a very appropriate question um you know uh, it's a similar thing in africa where the uh, the border of the, of the state uh, entirely porous, and uh, people move across them uh, in, in you know the daily life uh, all the time. But the borders have a very uh, powerful function. Now, in the border between uh, Bengal and West Bengal, or Bangladesh and West Bengal, the psychological power of this is is immense. So it shows two things. It shows the uh, mobility of the transnation, because the transnation can move uh, around and beyond those borders, but it also shows the psychological power of those bordering practices. The bordering practices are not simply line, fence drawn. The bordering practices are the practices by which uh, identity is controlled. And that has 
you know, they, the powers of be bring in all kinds of things like religion, culture, uh, politics, to uh, co create borders that convince people that their identity is uh, is constructed by those borders. Now, what I think uh, the positive and perhaps utopian uh, possibility of those people moving uh, back and forth across the borders is that the borders are porous and particularly with the creative imagination uh, those borders can be uh, can be crossed and crossed with a, a view of a different kind of world. Thank you so much, Professor. This is the question Hello, that... Professor Mondol, I request you to ask your question yeah. directly. Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Ascroft. Uh, sure. My question is that when you are speaking about uh, bordering practices, uh, it's, it's almost a kind of refusal to the borders. Then uh, my question is what happens to in, in, in case of uh, transnationality when we are speaking about so many hyphenated identities, uh, Malayan, Fijian, Indian, mm. what happens in that case? Well, firstly, um, when I talk about transnation, I, I'm not talking about necessarily transnationalism, but the transnationalism is a function of the mobility of, of uh, of subjects okay and that mobility is always confined by the bordering practices of states not just their physical borders but by the psychological political and cultural borders and so what uh, we see in what you call hyphenated identities is uh, people who have the capacity to cross those borders if they have the capacity to do it but very often they're caught in the hyphen. And the hyphen cannot provide an adequate description of, of the fluidity and mobility of, the, uh, of identity in the world. So, so what you have is there's this constant tension, a constant tension between the mobility of people uh, the fluidity of identity and the bordering practices of the state, which are, in short, the reason that those identities are hyphenated. Now, I think, you know, we should do away with the hyphen. I, uh, I started, we started uh, with a hyphen in post-colonial, but uh, that kept confusing people who thought it meant uh, after colonialism. So uh, we got rid of the hyphen. And perhaps we should get rid of the hyphen in transnational movements. Well, thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Unmute yourself, please. Professor Malik, unmute yourself. Thank you, Un you ma'am. Uh, there is another question for you, sir, uh, uh, by KRSPL. I actually I, I, I didn't read out the full name of the, uh, the, the person. So uh, here I read out this question on his behalf. Uh, Nobel Prize winner Rabindranath Tagore said that a feeling of nationalism can be detrimental to world peace. Dr. Bill, uh, do you seem to reflect a similar view Nobel Prize winner Rabindranath Tagore said that the feeling of nationalism can be detrimental to world peace. And he asked, I mean, he questioned you, uh, uh, do you think the reflect to similar uh, same thing in your eye? I mean, what about your opinion? Well, it's absolutely right. Uh, nationalism is a threat to world peace. I want to suggest something even more. Uh, uh, troubling, and that is nationalism and genocide go hand in hand. And nationalism and racism go hand in hand. So nationalism is not just love for one's country. Nationalism is about some very severe bordering practices. And 
nationalism and the kind of populist nationalism that's being promoted by politicians today is extremely detrimental to royalties. And I think that um, it's, uh, it demonstrates the urgency of uh, ordinary people sort of overcoming uh, the strictures and ordinary practices of the state. But also, it does give us hope that the capacity of artists and writers to imagine a different kind of world, a world beyond uh, national identity, uh, is possible. Time that that is not bounded by national borders. Um, that, I think, is um, the utopian hope that, uh, that I have for literature. But it doesn't alter the fact that national identity is a very, very handy thing for politicians. National identity is the way to keep power. Uh, fear, fear of the other, is a way to keep power. And the, um, uh, the acceptance of the other, which in Kant's terms is the essence of cosmopolitanism, uh, is is a way in which a, a world can be shared. Now, I don't. Want to, I have a few sort of doubts about cosmopolitanism because it's a very white term and it's very open to people who can move. But uh, but the ethical basis of cosmopolitanism is one that jumps beyond the bordering practices of the state and of national identity and and i think this is the way in which uh the world can um see a different kind of future you know it may be it may be utopian but uh it's up to those people imaginative artists and writers to to conceive it because nothing is achieved unless it's first imagined and we need to imagine a world where nationalism and genocide, nationalism and racism are abolished. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, and Professor Bill has talked. Here we uh, just wind up the whole question and answer session. Over to Professor Sarvani Banerjee to sum up the session uh, and move forward for next. Sir, uh, you said that uh, borders are necessary and yet nationalism is detrimental for national health. So how and since there are more than 77 borders today and border skirmishes are the reality, uh, if we do away with the sense of nationalism and nation state as Tagore uh, advocated, yeah. Do you think that borders will vanish in a perfect utopia? In a perfect utopia, they would. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, borders will vanish when power vanishes. Borders are instituted and maintained by power relationships. And that's where the problem lies. It's in the power relationships that... Uh, uh, bordering practices uh, set up in order to um, organise people's sense of who they are. And that's where the, the real danger is. What, uh, what writers give us is a potential to see uh, ourselves beyond those borders, beyond those uh, um, strictures. Now, um, you know, I, I don't have any very optimistic things to say about um, nations and borders and international peace. But uh, what I would emphasize now is that the capacity of the imagination through the creative spirit is one thing that can show us the way to a different kind of world. Okay. Ma'am, may I just add to your question? Hello? 
क्राइसिस <laughs> Here we have observed the entire world mourning for George Floyd. So maybe, maybe uh, this virtual camera that is slowly trying to, you know, wipe at least uh, this everyday borderings. I mean, Professor, do you look at this as a sort of a new possibility towards a sort of borderless world? Thank you. I uh, I do. Now, you know, I'd have to say that America. has led the world in racism and america's problems are grounded not just in racism but in slavery and slavery is the thing that generates inequality slavery is the thing that has even centuries later uh prohibited people from voting and this is something that's now being faced and i think the you know the murder of george floyd uh is something is a kind of trigger point for people that the 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 response to that was global and i th- i say that as as something that gives us hope gives us hope people are not going to put up with racism inequality slavery uh any more the violence of power continues and it's up to individuals you know the trans nation you know i i heard a very interesting statement that is protest is the voice of the unheard so the unheard need to protest and that protest can generate waves and ripples throughout the world so yeah i think that uh, we may possibly be seeing at a time when our political leaders seem to be at their worst this is also a time where there is greater hope for people overcoming uh things such as racism and and uh, and the the violence uh against people of uh uh thank you professor uh, uh mr kumarishan assistant professor of vivekananda college madurai asks a very very interesting and a rather a personal question he says dr bill your lecture is outstanding how do you prepare and plan for your lectures especially the present one is so seamless ideas are so well connected well, now we would all like to know that Well a lecture such as this has taken half a lifetime to prepare for <laughs> it's taken three books and uh uh I prepare it yeah I mean thanks it's very complimentary what you say but uh I I have certain passions that uh that underpin all my preparation for for these things passion for justice for equality passion for liberation and freedom and so i keeping these things in mind that's the thing that generate what i uh, what i come out with what i what i say but i'm always looking for the the way ahead the new the ways in which we can push this field and um i hope this gives some idea of our certain ways in which it can be done Thank you so much uh, sir we have kept to our promise of 1 hour <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah 1 hour 10 minutes <laughs> just a few minutes extra yeah. i think uh, thank yeah. you so much i mean thank you is actually too small a word for the great warmth that we feel within our hearts you yeah. do not know how many young hearts you have enkindled by oh. your uh, <laughs> talk thank you so much Um, you. and we will keep uh, you know irritating you over the mail to find out some possible direction at any uh-huh. other time 
thank you. Thank you so much. And I will now uh, request uh, Professor Orunima Kormokar, uh, Associate Professor, as Assistant Professor of TDP College, to welcome our next speaker, Fiona McCann. Hello, Fiona. Good to see you. Hello, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Arunima, are you here? Yeah, yeah, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let's, uh, Sorry, uh, your camera well, is... Uh, camera, rot rotate your camera. Rotate your rotate, camera. Rotate your camera, please. Is yes. It okay? no? That's yes. perfect. Actually, my, That's right. my laptop is not working, so I had to manage somehow with my mobile phone. Okay. 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 Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. This is... Uh, I take the proud privilege to welcome our next speaker, who is Fiona McCann, presently working as a professor of post-colonial literature at the University of Lille, France. The title of her doctoral thesis is History and Stories in the Fiction of Yuvan Beha and Jui Uikom, Palimpsest Identities Hybridity. She has worked as a certified teacher and lecturer in various prestigious academic institutions. She was a lecturer teaching English for the non-specialized specialist in the University of Khan and Maranula Valley. She was a lecturer in studies on women, sex, and gender at the University of Lille. She has published numerous papers and articles in various national and international journals. She has written the English translation of the French novel Mutate by Sose Lanard. She holds prestigious positions in numerous literary and academic institutions like Post-Colonial Studies Association, International Association for the Study of Irish Literature, etc., to name only a few. Today, she will speak on the topic Border Poetics in Contemporary English and Indian Literature, Arunduti Roy and Mia Gallagher. Ma'am, please deliver your lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this very uh, warm welcome. And uh, really, it's just such a huge honor to, to be able to participate uh, in this webinar today. Um, it's very hard following on after Bill, so uh, <laughs> please bear with me. But uh, I am, I think that in some ways, what I'm going to say kind of follows on from some of the things that, that Bill was talking about, because my talk is going to engage with the question of nationalisms, uh, plural, and borders. So um, I'm not sure that I'm sketching out any new uh, avenues at all in post-colonial studies, but um, these are some of the questions that I'm interested in, in, in right now. Um, so I suppose the, the best place for me to start is to address the elephant in the room, which is what on earth could Ireland and India possibly have in common, apart from similar colours in their respective flags? Um, but as Nicholas Green uh, pointed out way back in 2007, uh, and I quote him here, Ireland and India, well, one is very small, a westerly island off the coast of Europe, the other occupies most of an Asian subcontinent. The population of one is 4.2 million, the other 1.1 billion. This is back in 2007, right? So the figures aren't exactly right. He goes on, there are two national languages in Ireland, only one of which most of its citizens can speak fluently. That language is English. There are 22 official languages in India, not to mention 18, at least 18 other unofficial ones, each spoken by 5 million people. Ireland and India are both republics and, ah yes, he concludes, they were both once parts of the British Empire. End of quote. Now he doesn't mention partition, but that's also the big uh, linking factor too uh, between Ireland and India. So uh, Green goes on to say that um, the history of contacts, interactions and comparison between the two countries is rich and complex and the interrelated colonial and post-colonial stories of Ireland and India proved to be fascinatingly comparable, both in their similarities and uh, their differences. Now, the aim of today's talk is not actually to go over the rich and intertwined histories of post-colonial India and Ireland. Plenty of scholars have already done this uh, before me. 
Um, and I've I decided not to do a PowerPoint because I was worried about the technical <laughs> glitches that could occur. Um, but I can send a bibliography afterwards uh, if anybody's interested in that. Um, so although I am myself, uh, personally speaking, a fervent defender of Ireland's post-colonial status, I say this because Ireland is often ignored in the field of post-colonial studies. Uh, and indeed, uh, the debate around Ireland's post-coloniality is quite an ugly one in Ireland itself. Um, but although I am a, a, a defender of this, of this status, the neoliberal agenda, which has been rampantly pursued by various governments, really since the 1960s and, and more so since the 1990s and the Celtic Tiger, dependent as this has been on direct and indirect exploitation of workers in other countries and indeed in Ireland, I think disqualifies Ireland from the term post-colonial in this ultra contemporary period. Of course, this is a vexed question because the north of Ireland is still to all intents and purposes a colony. Uh, so it renders the whole post-colonial debate in Ireland uh, complex. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge, um, and I, I think it's very important to acknowledge that uh, one of the reasons why Ireland has kind of been excluded from post-colonial debates is because the Irish, as you know, I suppose uh, the first Britain's first colony um, participated in colonization um, and, and uh, you know, uh, were, were part of settler colonial groups in Australia, in Canada, uh, in various African countries and so on. It's complex is the, is the kind of long and short of this. Um, but I'm suggesting that the term post-colonial is complex in, in a, a context of, of rampant neoliberalism. And I would say that the same arguments are valid for contemporary India um, and uh, you know, the rise of a, a certain kind of extremist nationalism, uh, very re repressive responses to any sort of unrest or resistance whether in territorial or in environmental disputes, and indeed the two often go together. Um, and for more on this, I recommend, of course, Arundhati Roy's Capitalism, a ghost story. So in this talk today, I'm more interested in gathering together a number of strands uh, in order to tease out some ideas uh, related to the establishment of two authors, uh, Arundhati Roy on the one hand, and Mia Gallagher, who probably nobody here has ever heard of, uh, she's not very well known, but I'm looking at how these two authors uh, establish what I'm going to call a border poetics. And so in order to do this, I'm going to rely a little bit on some decolonial theory by Walter Mignolo, some recent border theory by Thomas Neal, and some queer theory, uh, notably by Jack Halberstam. But I'm also inevitably, given the contexts of the two novels that I'll be analysing, I'm also going to be uh, investigating the representation of violence and various forms of terrorism, which I'm putting in scare quotes here, because in these novels, uh, terrorist acts are carried out both by militant freedom fighters and the state. Um, so you might already be thinking uh, that these four strands, decolonial theory, uh, borders, terrorism and queer bodies are strange bedfellows, and they are. Um, but I'm going to try and, and, and see how these authors play with physical, geographical, gender and generic borders in quite similar ways. And in doing this, so the agenda, if you like, behind all of this uh, by these authors is to invite reflection on globalization and the ways in which it rhymes with the destruction of natural resources, territorial invasions and usurpations, the marginalization of queers and the policing of non-normative non behaviors. So, Quite coincidentally, uh, Arundhati Roy published her long-awaited second novel, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness, in 2017, just a few short months after Irish author Mia Gallagher published her second novel, Beautiful Pictures of the Lost Homeland, in 2016. Both novelists had produced other work in between the publication of their first and second novels. Um, I don't need to tell anybody here about the extent of, of, of non-fiction, for example, that, that Arundhati Roy has produced uh, and Gallagher had, had produced a number of short stories. What's interesting to me is that both these novels have as their central character a transgender woman, the Hijra Anjum in Ministry and Geo, formerly Georgie, in Beautiful Pictures. These central characters are, however, somewhat displaced during the course of each narrative, decentered, as it were. And I think that this is very much in keeping with the 
political agendas of the authors. Other characters come to the fore. Um, both novels are very concerned with state and individual acts of terrorism and with the troubles engendered by territorial land claims. Uh, at, it's, it's in this that I, I think part of this talk will resonate with what Bill was saying there about nationalism and, and, uh, and violence, really. Both novels delight in foregrounding temporal and spatial slippage, making the reader work very hard to keep up. And both accentuate interstitial spaces, reconfiguring them and rendering them less marginal. Graveyards and lanes loom large in these novels. Um, so Arundhati Roy may only have written two novels, but she is the author of 14 essays and several interviews. These essays are all highly political, ranging from severe criticism of India's development of nuclear power to that of global capitalism, to a defense of Kashmiri independence, to opposition to US imperialism, and to support of Palestinian resistance to Israeli colonization, oppression and human rights abuses. Because she speaks so uh, vociferously on these questions, she has been labelled with, um, or she's been kind of saddled with the label uh, political writer. And this is always meant in a negative sense. The idea is somehow that fiction and, and the aesthetics of, of literary works um, have become subordinated to political activism and politics more gently, generally. And I think this is a way of dismissing her as a writer of fiction. But if we follow uh, French philosopher Jacques Rancière, um, then I think we can see that literature is inherently political. As soon as one puts pen to paper, uh, even if it's uh, you know, a very basic sentence, um, it's already political. And uh, although Rancière cautions against the idea that literature or art might lead people to change their ways, because um, he, he's very lucid about the fact that it doesn't, he does suggest that a reconfiguration of the sensible is possible through literature, notably by bringing into being what has previously been invisible and inaudible. Um, so the Ministry of Utmost Happiness has a much more complex structure uh, than uh, Arundhati Roy's first novel. We might want to reduce it to the stories of Anjum and, and Tylo, but this would be, I think, to miss out on the complexities of the novel. It's deliberately unwieldy it's purposely confusing for the Western reader in particular, who might be familiar, in, in fact, who's probably unfamiliar with uh, the intricacies of uh, various political and economic situations in India. It's much less of a textbook post-colonial novel uh, like The God of Small Things was, and it's more of a generic no an anomaly. Um, so there's a very obvious incorporation of practically every single important political and economic event in late 20th and early 21st century India. I suppose starting from the emergency in 1975 onwards, the Bhopal disaster in 1984 is represented, the Kashmiri conflict from the late 1980s, uh, the Naxalite Maoist insurgency, to, to name but these, and there are others. So much so that the novel has been somewhat negatively reviewed and has left uh, reviewers quite, com quite perplexed. Uh, some have called it a fascinating mess. Others, uh, not to name him, but Alex Clark in The Guardian calls it a curious beast, baggy, bewilderingly overpopulated with characters written in an often careless and haphazard style. Eileen Battersby, uh, who, who passed away last year, uh, the reviewer in the Irish Times was perhaps among the most scathing. She concludes after reading the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, I quote, within pages of this messy and superficial but good natured narrative, a sensation of deja vu takes over. It becomes apparent that Roy is gamely striving for a Rushdie like concoction while failing to replicate his trademark bombastic flourish. Everything is obvious in the Ministry of Utmost Happiness. The kindest comment to make about this formless, overhyped and conventional performance is that reading it is comparable to spending years knitting a giant sweater only to discover that it actually has three sleeves. Ouch. Um, I don't need to probably tell anybody here that a, a good deal of controversy has also surrounded the publication of this novel, um, partly because uh, Arundhati Roy acknowledges at the end in a very long acknowledgement section 
a debt owed to Dianita Singh, who clearly facilitated a source of inspiration for the character of Anjum. So Singh, uh, as most people know, I'm sure, uh, uh, was a, is a photographer uh, interested in creating book objects and has published several of them. Uh, and some recent works include mobile museums, which circulate and allow her work to be uh, presented and configured differently each time, thereby generating multiple possibilities. But one of Singh's best known photographic subjects was Mona Ahmed, who died in September 2017 at the age of 81. And Ahmed uh, was perhaps India's best known transgender woman uh, from Delhi. She too, like the character in the novel, lived uh, in a graveyard in Old Delhi, which became home to sex workers, the homeless and beggars for over three decades. Um, so th the problem is that, that Mona Ahmed is not actually acknowledged by, um, by Roy uh, for herself. So I'm going to look at the agenda behind the choice of a transgender individual as a main character uh, in just a second. But for now, I'd just like to remind us that we should bear in mind that this novel was published three years after a landmark ruling by the Supreme Court of India declaring transgender people to be a third gender and significantly 70 years exactly after Indian independence and independence, as we know, which saw the country partitioned, sundered with all the violent fallout that partitions always cause. I'm thinking here also of Ireland and, and Palestine. So there's no doubt that the novel is intended uh, as a comment on the state of the nation between the emergency in 1975, really right up until 2017. So, you know, over overviews about 40 odd years of contemporary uh, Indian history. So we might want to question how useful the term postcolonial is to define a novel which deals really um, mostly uh, with India's internal turmoil, uh, the rise of far-right nationalism, the embracing of neoliberalism, the advocacy of nuclear weapons, the destruction of the environment. What is significant, I think, and this responds uh, in some ways to what Bill was saying, what is significant is the way in which Arundhati Roy presents competing nationalisms in different ways, um, giving the lie to the usual dismissal of all nationalisms as inherently negative or violent. So while far-right nationalism is presented as barbaric, sometimes supremacist, uh, sectarian and violent, Kashmiri nationalism, for all that it is also extremely violent, is couched in different terms um, as a kind of an emancipatory uh, nationalism uh, coming up against the powerful Indian nation state which swallows up dissensus. So to go back to Rancière then, this is a novel all about dissensus so much that it defies categorization. It completely celebrates its own unwieldiness as alternate strands of stories collide rather than complement each other. Um, in a similar manner then, Mia Gallagher, this Irish author and her novel, Beautiful Pictures of the Lost Homeland, also disrupts novelistic norms and is just as unwieldy. Um, it's, it has also been reviewed by various um, critics as sloppy, messy, exactly the same kind of vocabulary that we see being deployed for uh, in the reviews of, of Arundhati Roy's novel. And just as Roy's novel nods to the Supreme Court decision in India to recognise transgender as a third gender, so too Mia Gallagher's novel resonates with the 2015 Gender Recognition Act in Ireland, which allows individuals over, all individuals over the age of 18 to self-declare their own gender identity. And indeed, young people aged 16 to 17 can also now apply to be legally recognised, um, although the process is a little more onerous. So for a country um, which only decriminalised homosexuality in 1993 and divorce in 1995, it's not bad going. Now, Mia Gallagher couldn't have known as she was writing this novel that Brexit was about to become much more than a UKIP fantasy and that the fragile peace process in the north of Ireland would be tested as the physically invisible Irish border threatens to become very visible once again, despite the wishes of the majority of Irish people. But it is coincidental that her novel should be so obsessed with borders, particularly the troubles engendered by the Irish border, which uh, many Irish writers tend to ignore. And just as we were asking ourselves whether post-colonial novel is the most felicitous term for Roy's novel, which is so Indocentric, one might well ask the same question of Gallagher's novel, much of which is focused 
on shifting borders in Central Europe, notably in and around Bohemia. In fact, both these novels show, I think, the limits of the post-colonial label and suggest perhaps that an engagement with decolonial politics and aesthetics might be um, a fruitful approach. Uh, and perhaps this is a case of theory catching up with literary practice once again. So a few words then on, on decoloniality. Uh, Walter Mignolo and Rolando Vasquez, in their introduction to a recent issue of Social Text on decolonial aesthetics, ex explain their terminology, what they call modernity stroke decoloniality. And the, the D is in brackets. They describe it in this way, I quote, they, so these terms, are a signpost of conflicting enunciations. The rhetoric of modernity and its continuing promises of salvation and the logic of coloniality, the continuing hidden process of expropriation, exploitation, pollution and corruption that underlies the narrative of modernity as promoted by institutions and actors belonging to corporations, industrialized nation states, museums and research institutions. Decoloniality, they say, appears between modernity and coloniality as an opening, as a possibility of overcoming their completeness and their uh, totalizing discourses. Decoloniality refers to the variegated enunciations springing from global local histories entangled with the local imperial history of Euro-American modernity, post-modernity and alter modernity. So if we're going to speak of Arundhati Roy's and Mia Gallagher's novels within the framework of globalization, then I would like to suggest that they are decolonial in their aesthetics. Both are full of radical critique of both politics and, and the arts, and both sketch out a space for marginality, liminality, and interestingly, even failure. These novels are full of decolonial subjects and subjectivities. So moving on now to the question of liminal spaces and marginal bodies, both novels make abundant use of liminal spaces. Andrum, once she leaves the already liminal space of the Quagba, a safe home for hijras, sets up home in a graveyard, and Geo spends most of her time as a child in the lane which runs behind her Dublin house. The graveyard in Roy's novel clearly stands for contemporary India. Um, it's a strong signifier of death, gesturing towards the death of post-independence hopes, the rotting of an ideal, but also of the ghosts which continue to haunt contemporary India, the legacy of British occupation, the advent of neoliberal uh, economics, and indeed the presence of US intelligence. But it's not just this, the graveyard is not just a symbol, uh, since indeed this graveyard in real life with Mona Abbott um, becomes reconfigured, a, a reconfigured space on the margins, both literally and figuratively, a space which welcomes marginal figures of all sorts. Now it gradually expands over the course of the novel, swells so as to accommodate shelter, all sorts of mod comms, even a swimming pool, um, and indeed a form of osmosis with the departed. Um, the, the graveyard as it swells becomes um, described as, as having different cell-like structures, which suggests that independence and autonomy are, 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 are possible. But these cell-like structures are built over graves where past and present are intertwined. And it seems to me that there's also a certain irony if we take into consideration grave as an adjective as opposed to the noun, since grave, you know, connotes something which is serious, solemn, sober, maybe even dull. Um, and if indeed there is a serious edge to uh, Anjum's creation of a, of a safe space in the graveyard in which to harbour marginals, there's absolutely nothing sober or dull about it quite the contrary um, and quite the motley crew. So that's one, uh, that's the, the, I suppose, marginal space in Roy's novel. In uh, Mia Gallagher's novel, the lane behind uh, Geo's house is where she meets what much later turns out to be an imaginary friend, Elaine, interestingly named, Elaine, who is uh, an ugly, emaciated and undernourished girl who has been abandoned by her parents and left to fend for herself. The symbolism is, I think, obvious. Geo, who feels desperately unhappy in the body of her assigned gender, male, befriends this waif, nourishing her in secret 
clothing her as best she can and educating her. This same lane is the scene of a later confrontation of heteronormative patriarchy and queer divergence when Gio goes back to visit it on a whim as a trans woman. The scene juxtaposes her observation of a group of youths flirting with each other, heterosexual youths, and acting out according to heteronormative expectations and her reminiscence of a conversation with her former lover, Mar. The passage is much too long to quote, um, but I will just quote the way in which the youths are described as they arrive. So I quote, the sharks and the jets, a gang of boys coming from the lane, a pack of girls heading up from the green. The boys were lanky and spotty, the girls luscious and dolled up, faces painted, bodies poured into spray-on jeans and fluoro tops. One of Macker's friends had just grabbed him, started wrestling the Coke bottle from him. They got into a headlock, cheers, jeers, giggles from the girls." End of quote. This performance of heteronormativity is shown as precisely that. Gio, who's narrating this scene, borrows from generic stereotype and popular culture, West Side Story, with the sharks and the jets. The girls are dolled up, suggesting their potential objectification. Their faces are painted, as in a kind of performance. The boys tussle over the phallic Coke bottle, and this uh, neatly dovetails this very heteronormative performance. Um, and it is that, since the girls cheer, and there's that lovely alliteration and consonants there at the end. So it is definitely a heteronormative performance, but the Coke bottle uh, allows this to be dovetailed with neoliberal capitalism and monopoly. Even the very syntax of the first part of the quotation with its balanced binary phrasing, the girls come this way, the boys come this way, works to reinforce binary gender oppositions. Fearful of a transphobic attack, Gio is hiding in a nearby hedge and one of the girls sees her through it and calls her a pervert. Now juxtaposed and indeed interweaved into this episode are a series of memories of Gio's time with her lover, Mar, and her body's changing state as she was undergoing the transition process. In one of these memories, she remembers Mar recoiling as he brushes his chin against her breasts, which are still at this point covered in stubble. Initially embarrassed, she ends up laughing too at what she calls her jelly tots, jelly tits in a sea of stubble, unquote. The passage ends up with her musing over Mar's desire to be, quote, a family man, even if that family was just the two of us, him and me, end of quote. Now, the fact that these memories are coming to her as she stands in the lane, this interstitial space, observing the group of young heterosexual people is significant. This lane, then, this in-between space, is where heteronormative and non-heteronormative existences collide. And what appears monstrous here notwithstanding what the girl says when she calls Gio a pervert, is in fact heteronormativity with its pretenses, its performances, its embedded violence, its over-the-topness and its vulgarity. Gio's colourful image of her anatomy and her tender recall of her relationship with Mar provide a reconfiguration of marginality, bringing it into the mainstream and overtly celebrating a failure to conform. So moving on then to from the question of liminal spaces to the question of border politics, um, a significant part of um, ministry, the Ministry of Utmost Happiness concerns the territorial war over the Kashmir Valley. While beautiful pictures of the lost homeland devotes considerable attention to the shifting borders around Bohemia and on the island of Ireland from the Middle Ages onwards. This interest in borders, barriers and the limits of territories is to be linked to both authors' interest in queering the pitch and offering a decolonial perspective on Indian and European history. All of this, in other words, is interlinked. There are, apart from the interstitial spaces that we've, we've mentioned, there are other improbable spaces uh, in, in, and contested spaces, indeed, uh, in these novels. The contested space of the Kashmir Valley in ministry and the even more improbable space of what is called the Wunderkammer in Beautiful Pictures, which I'll explain in just a moment. All of these places are decentered, they are marginal, and they are a means of exposing how borders function, and also how they are evidence, as Thomas Nail would have it, of kino politics. 
So for Thomas Nail, and I really recommend reading his, his, uh, two of his books, in fact, A Theory of the Border and The Figure of the Migrant for anybody that's interested in uh, border studies. But he says, I quote, since the border is always in between and in motion, it is a constantly changing process. Borders are never done, including someone or something. This is the case not only because borders regularly change their selection process of inclusion. Um, sorry, this is not only the case because empirically borders are at the outskirts of society and within it, but because they regularly change their selection process of inclusion such that anybody might be expelled at any moment. So in Mia Gallagher's novel, this Wunderkammer is like a literary aesthetic companion piece to Nail's work on borders. It's very hard to describe. It's, a, it's an ambulant, interactive museum, not fixed in any particular time space, a potentially dangerous experience, and it exposes no artwork. It is, in fact, first described at the beginning of the novel in this way, um, and I quote, like all lost territories, this space refuses to answer to a single name. Terms such as Kunstkabinett, Wunderkammer, Sondersammlung, Theatre of Memory, Cabinet of Curiosities and Picture House of Intriguing Objects will pop up from time to time as monikers. Please regard these, at, to all intents and purposes, as interchangeable. This is not history, her story, in any factual sense, but, like all art cabinets, a stab at creating a semblance of order out of chaos via subjective choices. We wonder, does every ripple of history have the same source? Boom. If her story is a wave, what is the medium through which it ripples? Can waves of a specific our story and its variants, history, her story, their story, your story, a story, as well as the Holy Grail, the story, ripple through other mediums? And crucially, what happens when we meet and eat a medium's end. So the log notes from which this extract is taken are disseminated throughout the novel, seemingly randomly and narrated by a depersonified first person plural narrator, a sort of disembodied curator of sorts. They relate the material history of Bohemia, later Sudetenland, often linking it to Ireland, and the experience is olfactory, visual and kinesthetic even in fact physical when parts of it blow up. And this is of course symbolic of the explosive nature of the kinds of curiosities found inside. But what this introduction to the Wunderkammer uh, foregrounds is the subjectivity of museums and the potential violence in the use of the word, word stab uh, in that description I just read, the multiple versions of history always at play and the domination of certain histories over others and the mediums or frequencies through which these histories reach us are all broached uh, in this section. The log notes in fact serve as a backstory for Lotte and Anna Bauer, uh, two characters in the novel. Lotte is a young English hippie who um, actually is a home help in Gio's family when her mother is dying of cancer. And her mother, uh, Anna, is a German Sudetenland survivor of World War II who flees to Britain after the war and who is being interviewed for a television documentary about that experience of migration. So as you can see, it's an extremely complex novel. Often facetious in tone, these log notes disseminated throughout the novel begin with maps. Um, and uh, in, in this way, kind of uh, the Wunderkammer resonates from the beginning, from the very first map described as the Urkarte, the original of the species, short on political borderlines, heavy on topographical features. Um, so it, it uh, resonates from the beginning with Nail's words uh, quoted above about borders regularly changing their selection process. Thomas Nail in both of his books is in fact at pains to show that borders, contrary to popular thinking, are not binary. Instead of, he says, instead of dividing into two according to the static logic of sovereign binarism, the border divides by movement and multiplication. Later, the log notes emphasize this in their presentation of 20th century history in Central Europe and the disputing parties among Czechs and Germans linking them to uh, their Irish counterparts. So connections are made throughout between shifting borders in Europe and shifting borders in, in Ireland. After the, one of the final log notes turns into what is called a musical Schattenspiel, 
as boundaries shift and morph between 1914 and 1933, uh, Log Note 9 is uh, another form of entertainment with five acts and a finale which recounts, I quote, the subordination of the Sudeten borderlands to Reich policies through to the final liberation of Czechoslovakia by the Red Guard and the Czech militias, culminating in a rousing group photo of the expulsions of 1945, at which point the entire German population of the Sudetenland, as if by magic, disappears. Now this flippant tone, uh, which you can uh, perceive in the quotation that I just gave you, dominates throughout these log notes and euphemisms abound. Given the extreme violence of this history, we all know now about the mass rape of German women on the border, other forms of sexual assault and incest, individual and group acts of terror. So given our, our shared knowledge of this, this flippant tone, so far from the ostensibly neutral and informative tone of most museums, in fact increases the horror because of the disjuncture. Presenting the conflicting loyalties at state in a given territory, and the forced expulsion of German Sudetens as a form of entertainment enables Mia Gallagher to deliver a scathing criticism of border politics as understood by Wendy Brown, who says, I quote, political walls have always spectacularized power. They have always generated performance and symbolic effects in excess of their obdurately material ones, unquote. So while there is some humor in, our, in um, Mia Gallagher's novel, there is very little humour uh, in Roy's representation of both the Kashmir uh, conflict and the Maoist Naxalite insurgency, both of which occupy a substantial part of the second half of the novel. Now, Roy has commented at length on these in her book, Capitalism, A Ghost Story, but in Ministry, she incorporates both of these into the complex narrative of the nation, which she op in which she opens up spaces for dissensus. The territorial dispute over Kashmir is accompanied in fact, even mirrored by ideological lines. I quote, as the war went on in the valley, the soft line gradually hardened and the hard line further hardened. Each line begot more lines and sublines. end of quote. So there's a sort of biblical begetting um, foregrounded here. And in fact, Roy does a wonderful job of conveying the incremental radicalization of the citizens of the region. I'm just going to quote a short passage from, uh, from the novel. Martyrdom stole into the Kashmir Valley from across the line of control through moonlit mountain passes manned by soldiers. Night after night, it walked on narrow stony paths wrapped like thread around blue cliffs of ice across vast glaciers and high meadows of waist deep snow. It trudged past young boys shot down in snowdrifts, their bodies arranged in eerie frozen tableau under the pitiless gaze of the pale moon in the cold night sky and stars that hung so low, you felt you could almost touch them. When it arrived in the valley, it stayed close to the ground and spread through the walnut groves, the saffron fields, the apple, almond and cherry orchards like a creeping mist. It whispered words of war into the ears of doctors and engineers, students and labourers, tailors and carpenters, weavers and farmers, shepherds, cooks and bards. They listened carefully and then put down their books and implements, their needles, their chisels, their staffs, their plows, their cleavers, and their spangled clown costumes, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so then they, they basically begin to engage in, in violence. So the passage is too long really to do much justice to uh, in this short uh, time in, in terms of analysis, but I would just note the personification here of, of um, really incremental violence the incorporation of fable. Uh, we notice elements of the pastoral here, but of course also of the Gothic. This is presented as a kind of creeping contagion. Uh, we have a sense of temporal stasis, the representation of all, um, all members of the villages, all kinds of professions. The bounty of the land is emphasized, the attention paid to hands and ears. And all of this is juxtaposed to the final blood curdling uh, implications of the final sentence which I will read you now, only after they had been given guns of their own, only after they had curled their fingers around the trigger and felt it give ever so slightly, after they had weighted the odds and decided it was a viable option, only then did they allow the rage and shame of the subjugation they had endured for decades, for centuries, to course through their bodies 
and turn the blood in their veins into smoke. So Roy obviously here is describing lines close to the line of control and the metaphor of the mist, I think uh, here enhances the porosity of that border in spite of all the attempts uh, to partition and divide. As Thomas Nail has pointed out, I quote, barbed wire has become an almost universal symbol of political violence, nationalism and oppression. In many instances, those using barbed wire may even intend for the wire to summon this historical and violent meaning. In fact, Roy presents the line of control as directly murderous. I quote, in remote border areas near the line of control, the speed and regularity with which bodies turned up and the conditions some of them were in wasn't easy to cope with. Some were delivered in sacks, some in small polythene bags, just pieces of flesh, some hair and teeth, unquote. The passive constructions here, at odds with the initial agency of the bodies and the deliberate understatement, not easy to cope with, all testify to the brutal fallout of territorial disputes and the constant threat of violence. The agents of torture and murder are never identified. They could, in fact, almost be the mist. Wendy Brown cogently suggests that, I quote, as a boundary marker that is also a form of power, sovereignty bears two different faces. These appear in two different dictionary meanings of sovereignty, supremacy and autonomy, and two equally discrepant political usages as decisive power or rule and as freedom from occupation by another, unquote. The valley uh, presented here has only limited autonomy and is very much under the yoke of Indian supremacy. But Roy, and I think this is a very interesting point, makes sure not to sugarcoat actions carried out by the insurgents either. Uh, and this also, I think, accounts for the elided agents uh, in the passage that I quoted above. This same elision of agency is present in the opening chapter of Beautiful Pictures um, by Mia Gallagher. Uh, this opening chapter is the description of the moments preceding a suicide bomb attack in the London underground, told in a first person plural voice. The proximity of all of those squashed into the tube carriage is rendered through a series of synecdoches. I quote, for example, the millimeter thin membrane between arse and cock, tit and elbow, mouth and forehead. We drink in each other's scent, unquote. And this, um, I think, also uh, already announces the porosity of boundaries, which will be explored in so many other ways uh, in the novel. There are enough clues present to guess by the end of the novel who the individual perpetrator is, but the opening passage interestingly privileges a collective rather than an individual act, thereby, I think, inviting us to tackle questions of terrorism differently and see them in a context of global geopolitics. Nothing is sugarcoated here. There are no easily identifiable goodies and baddies. Border politics are world politics. So while Roy and Gallagher tackle this border politics in different ways, using very different tones, they convey a similar point. Borders as expressions of national sovereignty exert both centrifugal and centripetal control of movement. And, and one quotation from uh, Roy's novel, I think, uh, illustrates this beautifully. I quote, tourists flew out, journalists flew in, honeymooners flew out, soldiers flew in, unquote. So there is this centrifugal and centripetal control of movement um, and constant movement even when the border appears static over decades. In fact, the more the walls or borders are reinforced, the more waning the sovereignty of the state concerned is. So I'm, I'm moving now towards my conclusion, but I, I wanted to say something a little bit more optimistic and, and not end on, 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 on such a negative note. Uh, and so I, I see um, a potentially more uh, optimistic way of reading these novels um, and an attempt, I suppose, to bring together or through an attempt to bring together the queer and decolonial strands of these texts and link them to the question of, of border politics. So Jack Halberstam, when she was still writing, on, when he was still writing under the name of Judith, um, has made a thought provoking case for thinking differently about failure as a means of resistance to our neoliberal world. Now he starts out with an explanation of how the cartoon SpongeBob SquarePants and uh, the film Little Miss Sunshine present compelling arguments for celebrating failure. And he suggests that, I quote, academic, activists, artists, and cartoon characters 
have long been on a quest to articulate an alternative vision of life, love and labour and to put such a vision into practice. He argues that success in a heteronormative capitalist society equates too easily to specific forms of reproductive maturity combined with wealth accumulation. And after noting that, I quote, failing is something that queers do and have always done exceptionally well, unquote, he goes on to ask, what kinds of reward can failure off offer us? Perhaps most obviously, failure allows us to escape the punishing norms that discipline behavior and manage human development with the goal of delivering us from unruly childhoods to orderly and predictable adulthoods. Failure preserves some of the wondrous anarchy of childhood and disturbs the supposedly clean boundaries between adults and children, winners and losers. And while failure certainly comes accompanied by a host of negative affects, such as disappointment, disillusionment and despair, it also provides the opportunity to use these negative affects to poke holes in the toxic positivity of contemporary life. Both Gallagher and Roy, I would argue, do precisely this. They poke holes in the toxic positivity of contemporary life in the context of the extreme brutality of the neoliberal economies of Ireland and India. Neither Anjum nor Geo, nor indeed many minor characters like Saddam Hussein or Tylo in Ministry or Lotta in Beautiful Pictures, none of these characters conform to stereotypical notions of success. Anjum lives in a graveyard and Leo, uh, by the end of, uh, of Gallagher's novel, is possibly facing breast cancer Anjum has no desire to be taken seriously, even if she does enjoy some media attention in her youth, and Geo eventually gets to that point also. Neither of these protagonists can be accused of entertaining what Halberstam calls triumphalist accounts of gay, lesbian and transgender history that necessarily reinvest in robust notions of success and succession, unquote. Quite the contrary, in fact. Instead, what is privileged in these two novels is a sense of the simultaneous difficulty and beauty of what Halverson calls losing one's way in the territories of failure, forgetfulness, stupidity and negation. These characters wander, improvise, fall short and move in circles. This means, of course, that the novels themselves also tend to wander, improvise, fall short and move in circles. They are imperfect as the reviews I quoted before all gleefully pointed out, but this is the point. This deliberate imperfection is underscored by having a character in each novel who is an architect, Geo's father David and Tylo's lover uh, Musa Yewi. Geo's father is involved in the notorious uh, central bank building fiasco and Musa is a fighter for Kashmiri separatism. In both cases, the choice of profession is symbolic while Musa is fighting for the construction of a fairer Kashmir region, putting down the foundations for a better future, Geo's father, from a very working class background, is overlooked for promotion and indeed scapegoated when the central bank project ends up in a high profile court case, all of which reveals the rotten foundations of Irish society, a very far cry from the ideals held up by Connolly and Pierce and other protagonists involved in the 1916 Easter Rising. These flailing foundations are reflected formally in the unwieldy na nature of the novels, where characters, space-times and diegetic strands all collide constantly. Both novels, however, offer a reconfiguration of the nuclear family. In Beautiful Pictures, this is more negative. Lottie is sexually abused by the captain, her mother's partner, and her twin brother Andreas blows himself up as an anti-capitalist statement while she unwittingly films him. Her brief relationship with Owen, the left-wing nationalist, ends when he tells her he loves her, and of the twins born from that affair, only one survives. But the Wunderkammer turns out to be full of objects and explanations which are destined to show, following on generations, how the constantly shifting, rupturing and realigning of borders and ideologies provide context for Lotta's final action. All nuclear families are dysfunctional in this novel, but Geo and Mar temporarily embody the, the possibilities for queer family configuration, reconfigurations. In Ministry, Anjum falls in love with an abandoned baby girl at the observatory in Delhi, and when the baby disappears, tracks her to the home of Tylo who has taken her, 
and named her Miss Jibin II in memory of Musa's daughter, who was killed by the Indian army. Anjum convinces Tylo to move in with her at the graveyard, which he does, and a form of communal parenting emerges. This, in fact, was already the case earlier in the novel when Anjum adopted a young girl, Zainab, who was living in the Kwak when she was living in the Kwakba. One day, a letter from the biological mother of the baby arrives at the graveyard in which she explains that her daughter was conceived from multiple rapes due to her involvement as a Maoist guerrilla fighting on behalf of the Adivasi people against the nation state and its destructive economic and environmental policies. The mother is dead by the time the letter reaches the graveyard, but Anjum and the others, humorously and ironically referred to as, I quote, the graveyard Politburo, unquote, are able to bestow the baby's original name, Udaya, on her while keeping her new name also. Knowing this story makes all the graveyard inhabitants, I quote, close ranks around the baby like a formation of trees or adult elephants, an impenetrable fortress in which she, unlike her biological mother, would grow up protected and loved, unquote. So from failure, destruction and violence emerges a new collective, gender fluid, communal and decidedly queer family configuration. So to conclude then, are these two novels, decolonial, queer, terrorist border fictions, sketching out contours of what we might call a border poetics? If following Nail, we see borders as constantly shifting and as regimes of so social circulation, kino politics, then we can, I think, see these novels as providing an aesthetic which corresponds to this, as the novels that themselves are full of temporal and spatial slippage, even between uh, those who are dead and those who are alive, and they're constantly doubling back on themselves. Terrorism looms large in both novels, whether by individuals or the state, and suggests that territorial border disputes, usurpations and violence have long been the most devastating aspects of our increasingly globalized world. Queer subjects in this context have the power to disrupt hegemonic ways of being by investing marginal spaces and refusing or failing to conform. But most of all, these novels are, I posit, decolonial in their content and aesthetics. Thematically, they contest the neoliberal narrative which is presented as modernity and progress, especially in post-colonial states like Ireland and India. And they reveal to what extent this agenda is contingent upon exploitation, expropriation and elimination. Formally, these novels disrupt. Gone, I think, are the days of writing back. Ireland and India write back to themselves in these texts, and a very ugly mirror image is held up for scrutiny. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona, for that wonderful lecture. Especially, you were quite rightly said at the beginning that not many of us are well acquainted with the modern Irish literature, especially post-colonial literature. So you have opened a, not just a window, but a big door for us. You know, it already gives us ideas to start reading up Irish literature now. Our Irish uh, literature knowledge is uh, fixed with Madame Gregory and the old oh. Irish revolution <laughs> that we all did in our you know, school and then post school classes in English. Now, as you can see from the chat box, that there have been a lot of questions generated from your paper. I will first ask uh, to unmute somebody you know very well, our very dear Claire. She's there and she wants to ask you a question. Claire, Claire would you please unmute and uh, open your video so that we can see you and you can ask Fiona directly. Hello, I'm not sure. Hello, everybody. It's lovely to be here across time zones. It's quite unreal. To me. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I cannot open my video because I'm using um, not the device I'll be using tomorrow. But can you hear my voice? Yeah. Can you hear me? Good. Yeah. <laughs> this, yeah. this was just a, a very general question I wanted to ask you, Fiona, thanking you for this uh, wonderful talk, understanding that when one engages into comparisons, it's always such, um, well, it, it's, it, I admire people who can do that because they can cross borders, as Bill was saying earlier on, and these are powerful acts of the imagination. So thank you for what you did. And my question also had to do with borders, but borders of a generic genre. I was wondering, 
if there are political aspects in Roy's novel that require fiction or the form of the novel for their expression, because she's written so many essays and you know pamphlet, political pamphlets, and and uh, she's been very outspoken uh, in recent years. She's only written two novels. So what could she do in a novel that she couldn't do uh, in one of her many? Um, in her, her many uh, moments of, of, of outspokenness uh, in the media or even in books or essays. Thank uh, thanks, Claire, for that question. Um, that's uh, it's a hard question to answer because, uh, in many ways, I think the the novel, the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, is like a, compa a fictional companion piece to uh, a lot of her political work, her her uh, non fictional work. But I think perhaps one. Uh, possible response might be, um, and it resonates a little bit with something that Bill mentioned too, about the possibilities of fiction for uh, presenting things differently. There's nothing utopian at all uh, about the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, but I think that there are um, I, I think that the, the um, the, the, for example, the, the kind of longish quotation that I read there about the way in which violence crept into the Kashmiri region and it's presented in a very gothic, almost, uh, you know, almost surreal uh, kind of form um, is, is a flight of fancy, certainly, like a, 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 a use of the imagination and a, and a different way of presenting something that might uh, speak to people differently than a political tract. Mm -hmm. And I also think that her nonfiction targets certain or you know is read by let's say certain people and fiction may be a slightly wider spread mm -hmm. um, and is also a way of making political statements um so I'm, I'm not sure if that really answers your question claire but no thank you I mean, it's just that it is a difference that i'm curious about yeah and, uh, it, it is so remarkable that even the most articulate um political activists and okri is also another example people who can you know, sort of wield together uh, art and uh, politics with some topics or on some issues have to resort to what fiction only can do yeah. and, and, and express and i'm curious about those vectors that in fiction may be possible to as you said reach out touch people in a way that is so um, unique and so it is also our job, of course, to try and understand how this works as a yeah. very person. <laughs> I, I think too, um, sorry, just as I'm listening to you, kind of, it's become clear to me what I think I mean. I th this is personal, this is how I respond to fiction, but probably it's the same for, for all of us. I suppose the difference is that when you are interested and invested in a character in a novel, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it, 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 uh, our emotional roller coaster is 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 vaster, let's say, than when we read mm -hmm. a political text. And I'm thinking also of uh, Amitav Ghosh, mm -hmm. who, um, you know, I was kind of worried after I read The Great Derangement, thinking, right, that's it. He's never going to write fiction again because mm -hmm. he basically says that you know fiction isn't up to the task. And mm -hmm. then he published Gun Island, you mm -hmm. know, um, and again we see that need where it, it's the storytelling, in fact, and the investment in character that perhaps is is what gives fiction uh, mm -hmm. its not the upper hand, but but makes it kind of um, necessary, at least mm -hmm. in one, one possibility. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting to see how. Yeah. Okay, we'll have this conversation later. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's just the screen. You know, the screen gives you the impression that that there's just the two of you, but there are 110 people listening in. So let's hear your students. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claire, for asking me a lovely question and so the session has warmed up i will now invite uh Shobhik Dotto, who is a uh, uh, faculty of our english department tdb college to conduct the question answer session as you can see there are a lot of questions in the chat box over to Shobhik. thank you thank you thank you so uh, good afternoon to everybody uh, i have a question from mr bojan to Mukherjee, and he asks the question uh, that if Arundhati Roy's and uh, Gallagher's representation of border politics and crisis is harrowing, then why are they both criticized instead of being lauded, uh, you know, for their brave and, uh, you know, experimental approach? 
means what if they're ruffling the feathers of the governments if they're ruffling the feathers of the authorities why are they not being lauded by the people instead they're being criticized often yes so thank question you. from mr bojan to mukherjee thank you very much for that question i think it's a really important one because as you say predictably enough authorities and nationalities you know don't look kindly on, on these kinds of representations if they even deign to think that fiction in fact you know has any importance whatsoever but what's even more interesting is that the literary establishment has been you know much more in the case of arundhati roy mia gallagher doesn't have anywhere near the notoriety of 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 roy um and so it's it's a different scenario but uh to think back to, for example, Aileen Battersby, the, the uh, reviewer in the Irish Times, who, who basically criticised uh, Roy for being not rushdie like enough. I mean, it's unreal that this, you know, that this kind of disqualification um, can occur. So when Rushdie does something political, it's fine. Uh, but when Roy does it, it's not. And I, I do think that there's this very, one of the things that I'm kind of battling with in my own kind of personal research at the moment is to move away from uh, judgment values on how good or bad literature is uh, because I think that we who are we to say <clears throat> really what's good and bad because each of us subjectively has a response to you know to, to, to various texts so I think rather than focus on because I, I, I think that this means that we have to apply a very canonical almost grid like uh, evaluative way of looking at literature so rather than looking at that I'm interested in sidelining the question of whether it's good or bad literature and some of the critics, I think, tended to uh, um, sideline Roy by saying this just this book isn't as good as it should be. I want to put that question aside and say it doesn't matter. You might think it's bad. I might think it's good. That's not the question. The question is, what aesthetic tools does Roy use to convey a political statement? That's all I'm interested in. Um, and I think that critics who um, are very uh, fast to criticize books for novels in particular for being too political, um, uh, you know, I think they're in their ivory tower. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but it's a good question. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I'll move on to the next question then. Uh, it's from Ujjaini Sinha Roy, and uh, she asks that the nature of Ireland and Kashmir can be considered quite similar, well, except for the sea. Uh, does nature play a part in these struggles for sovereignty? Thank you for that question. Um, that's also very interesting. Um, I mean, obviously, there are, I think, a lot of parallels to be made in terms of the fallout of partition in both Ireland and, and, um, and India, India, Pakistan, let's say. Um, and and uh, there's been a lot of, quite a lot of work done on that. What is interesting, I think, is that the north of Ireland and Kashmir are still kind of contested territories. Um, and I think that obviously it's 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 much more complex uh, in 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 Kashmir, um, partly because it's landlocked in a way that Ireland isn't. Uh, as you were saying, the the sea is the difference, and uh, the, the situation is less complex in Ireland because we have a, a you know there is a, a a kind of geological entity which is the island, right, and then Britain across the way, um, and and I so I think that that the, the that, that changes the, um, I suppose, the issues at stake. And um, the other is that population-wise, uh, the scale is obviously tiny in Ireland in comparison to uh, to the Kashmiri conflict. Um, although I suppose if we look at the thirty-year conflict in the north, there are similarities to be uh, to be established there. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's it's not something actually that I've thought enough about. Um, and I'll have to think a little bit more about that. Um, when, when you say, does nature play a part in these struggles for sovereignty? Um, it's there, obviously, but I would say that nature in the sense of, yeah, the, the, um, the, ge you know, the geological kind of construction of Ireland as an island renders the, the border question there different uh, to the one um, in Kashmir. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I, I would like to request Dr. Nilanjana Chatterjee if she could ask ask her question directly by unmuting herself. Yes, thank you, ma'am. 
Thank you, Shobhit. Uh, thank you, Fiona, ma'am. It was wonderful. And in fact, this is not a sort of question, but an observation. And this is an observation which actually a thought-provoking talk has made me to, you know, ponder upon. Uh, you know, I think uh, you know about the 5th, uh, 5th August 2019, uh, you know, the Black Day in India when the government of India actually limited the autonomy of Kashmir by imposing Article 370. And, uh, you know, I would just like to share my anxiety with you. Within this context, Arunthati Roy has sufficiently problematized the concept of Azadi. You know, because, because when the Kashmiris in the street of Kashmir call for Azadi, it is completely different from the way I call for Azadi in West Bengal. So, mm. so I, I just thought of sharing this anxiety with you. This is how mm. we are going, you know, we are experiencing Azadi in India a completely mm. two different perspective of Azadi. And mm. we are selflessly suffering. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you for that. I think um, I think that's a really, really important point. And I think uh, the whole question of independences and nationalisms um, that we were talking about before is so complex uh, that I think, first of all, we have to use plural forms. I think that's one way of gesturing towards the complexity of different situations. Um, and recognizing that um, people's um, requests or, or demands are, are context specific. And so the vocabulary that we use in one context, if we use that same vocabulary in another context, uh, as you say, it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. Um, and, and so, yes, it invites us, I think, to be more um, reflective, perhaps, on, on the vocabulary that we use. And so for me, uh, what I have the best that I've come up with is to use plural forms to, to indicate that um, in the case of nationalism, for example, that there's a, there's a big difference between um, kind of right wing national nationalist extremism uh, in Ireland or India or wherever um, and emancipatory nationalisms. So, it's a, yeah, that's a, it's a really good point. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, just, just a minute, Shaurav. Fiona, can we take two more questions? Do you have yeah, the time? Sure. Yeah, no problem. Okay, carry on, Chobik. Okay, so uh, I have one more question from uh, Boyjanto Mukherjee, and he asks that, you know, does the graveyard symbolize an all-inclusive and a flexible society that every other society or social establish, or social establishment rather, strive to achieve? Uh, thank you for that question too. I, I mean, the graveyard. What I, what's really interesting about the graveyard is that it's, um, it's a rejection of, all of the way of of the establishment, all of the ways in which societies are constructed, um, and especially uh, neoliberal societies are invited to, uh, citizens, if you like, or, or the populations of neoliberal societies are invited to constantly. Um, conform to, um, you know, consumerist imperatives, um, to live in a certain way, and that way might be very comfortable, but we're still kind of streamlined into that. And so the graveyard, I think, uh, in Roy's novel, uh, definitely symbolizes an all-inclusive all and a flexible society, but, and, and that, that is something to strive towards, but that, that striving, striving towards that means opting out, in fact. It means placing oneself on the margins of society. And so in that sense, I don't think it's possible for other societies to strive to that because it's, it's counter, you know, it's counterintuitive. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a counter behavior, really. It's placing oneself on the margins. So I would say that the people can strive to, you know, extricate themselves from, from the status quo and, um, but not a society, because a society is always going to go, you know, needs to order itself. Um, so what's interesting for me about the graveyard is, yes, that it's all inclusive and flexible, but that it's marginal. And in fact, if it doesn't stay marginal and if it becomes mainstream, then it won't be cutting edge anymore. You know, so it's a little bit like some of the um, uh, discourses that we have around, um, for example, around gay pride um, celebrations uh, that have become very mainstream, completely co-opted by the neoliberal agenda. Uh, and that, so then you have like kind of counter gay pride uh, manifestations going on 
where there's an opting out of that. So as soon as something becomes too mainstream, it's not cutting edge anymore. So that's why the graveyard is interesting in this novel is because it's, you know, and who wants to live in a graveyard really also. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating from that point of view. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for that detailed answer. Uh, I'll take one more question uh, from Rema Nilamegam. And she asks that, you know, does Roy exactly contemplate on the political aspects of the nation or does she simply talk about the independence of women? Besides being a stern political activist and feminist, is she politically active in her novels? Um, yes, she, um, I think in her novels, broaches all different kinds of independence. So one of them being, I mean, the Ministry of Utmost Happiness is, even the very title, the, the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, I think celebrates um, caring, ministry, you know, caring for others. Um, and part of that involves a reflection on a national level, right, in terms of what the nation, how the nation cares or does not care for or about certain uh, citizens of the nation. And then part, other parts of the novel are, um, and, and I thank you for raising the question of, of feminism, because there, there is one really strong uh, female character in the novel uh, Ministry of Utmost Happiness, who um, also opts out, refuses to... Um, um, so she's a, a freedom fighter and refuses to um, engage with kind of, once again, um, neoliberal kind of consumerist aspects of, of feminism, places herself uh, on, the, on the margins. So, yes, I would say uh, Roy is absolutely politically active uh, in her novels. Um, but I don't think that this stops the novel or novels being, uh, you know, um, very interesting uh, aesthetic objects also. I'm using that specifically that term aesthetic objects as opposed to good novels, which I do think they are, again, to move away from uh, valuative judgments um, on the quality of literature. But so, yes, she's politically active and she's also a, a very accomplished novelist, I think. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, with that, we have come to an end of our Q&A session. I'd like to hand over the virtual microphone to uh, Dr. Swarbani Banerjee, ma'am, uh, to continue the proceedings. Thank you, ma'am. OK, now we can rest in peace because we have had a fantastic session, uh, uh, starting with Dr. Ashcroft and now with uh, my good friend Fiona. Uh, what a wonderful way to end today. Thank you so much for making out time. I know their semesters are going on. They are very, very busy, but they could not say no to me. <laughs> that is what I carry with me. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. And I will be poking you again for some Irish literature later on, Fiona. <laughs> Absolutely no problem. It will be a pleasure to share with you on that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. With this, we conclude today's session. And all the participants here, we welcome you for tomorrow. It will start at 4.30. And tomorrow's first speaker is here with us today. Claire, I'm welcoming you in advance and we'll welcome you more specially tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Shorab, will you come please? Uh, yes. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Fiona McCann and uh, Bill S. Croft. Uh, Professor Bill Ascroft, and uh, let me uh, remind you that tomorrow the webinar is going to commence at 4.30. The portal yes. will be there. It will be open from 4.25 p.m. And tomorrow yes. we, uh, we shall have two distinguished uh, invited speakers, uh, uh, Claire uh, Omovere and uh, another uh, mm, very distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Sorry, Professor Bivas Choudhury, and both of them will uh, speak on the postcolonial postcolonialism and postcolonial theories, applications of postcolonial theories, etc. So, uh, uh, I sorry, we uh, we congratulate as well as we thank all the participants for supporting us, and yes. we also encourage you, yes, to attend uh, tomorrow's uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And I just I just have one more thing to add that today's audience here 
have been a wonderful admixture of there have been so many yes, yes, yes. senior university professors yes. there have been many college academicians there have been research scholars students from bengal from orissa from the south i want to thank each of you individually uh, but due to positive of time, I am just generalizing and I say that your presence has further enriched this program. Thank you so much. And we expect and we you know, cordially invite you for the other two days as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Thank you. Bye, Fiona. Bye. Thank you. Bye.